Hello everybody, uh, today I'm going to be talking about the PHP library for that, about using re reusable code in your Drupal projects. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Josh Taylor, uh, Drupal.org, my username is Josh Taylor, and Josh Tao on IRC. Uh, so basically, uh, with code sharing, why should you reinvent the wheel? Uh, there's so many great projects out there for PHP, especially in things like GitHub and other repositories like that. Uh, you can do a search and find pretty much anything. Uh, the nice thing about Drupal 8 is that they're starting to use that as well. So, yeah, it's great. Um, so basically, how has the PHP community solved this at large? There's a really good tool that's come out a couple of years ago called Composer. Um, uh, Composer is a tool for dependency management in PHP. So basically, you can create a composer.json file, which will tell the PHP project about all of your dependencies that you have in PHP, uh, sorry, for your project. Um, and then you can basically just run a, a command called composer install, and what that will do is it will install all of your dependencies for you. And all of your libraries and dependencies are pulled in automatically from GitHub and on other sources. So let's break this down. Basically, to install Composer, you can do a command, which is basically just curl s, and then grab the installer, and then pop it through to PHP, and that will install it for you. And you can use that on your Linux shared server. And then to run it, you just run composer.far, and then it'll give you a big output with all the um, different options that you can do, which you can use. Uh, so basically, the composer.json, that lives in the uh, root directory of your project. Um, uh, it's basically a JSON markup file with all the information about your project and all, and all of your dependencies. Uh, basically, this is just what the file looks like. So at the very top, you have your name for the project. So basically, that's your namespace. So mine's called Josh Taylor than some project. Then you have your description, uh, which is some project. And then the keywords that you want to use, your license, which is very important because obviously different licenses have got different restrictions that you can use. And then the author information. Um, the reason why you have this file is because there's a service called Packagist, which basically passes this information, which people can then look up really easily for your project. Uh, the next line you can do is basically you can start requiring all, all the different uh, packages that you need for your project. So for example, I'm using Stripe. Um, yeah, which is Stripe and then Stripe PHP, and then you can define a version. I haven't put a version in, but you can use like uh, Dev Master to grab the latest branch, or you can define it by a, um, a version name, for example, 1.0, 2.0, stuff like that. So that way, if something breaks in a version upgrade from 1.0 to 2.0, you won't have any problems when you when that comes to that because you're locked to that version. <coughs> um, and the next step is to run Composer install after you've created this file, and this is what it looks like. So you just run Composer install. Uh, it goes off to GitHub and it says, hey, can you grab me all these files? And then... Uh, did it freeze? <laughs> I think it froze. <laughs> no, it's a recorded video. I don't know why it's not... Oh, yeah, it goes. Uh, so, so basically, <laughs> thank God. Uh, yeah, it's put up. And then basically, um, it goes and downloads Stripe, Stripe PHP uh, from the 2.11 version. And if you've already, already unloaded it, it loads it from cache. So rather than having to like, download the same file over and over, and over again for your project, you can just load, load it from your local cache. So it speeds up things by a great amount. Uh, and the next thing is, how has the Drupal community solved this? So Composer came out after Drupal 7 came out, so people were trying to figure out how to solve library management in Drupal 7, and there's a couple of different ways that they tried to do this. Uh, the first version is a module called Libraries. Libraries is a Drupal API for referencing libraries, and you can download the library manually and put it into sites or libraries. Uh, when you install libraries, you can basically use it as, a, as an API. So for example, in the earlier example, I used Stripe. For this one here, I'm using Stripe again. So basically, um, in your install hook, you basically set up uh, where the file exists. So you can't actually install your module until you put the code into your directory. So it's really confusing for people like who, who don't know what they're doing. So basically, um, and then you have your hook libraries info as well inside your module. So for example, um, you have like basically have to list out every single version that you're using the Stripe vendor URL, the download URL, all that sort of things. So it's like a massive amount of work to actually get this to work. 
and then step three is success. So um, when you finish this off for your Drupal 7 project, how do you like manage this? Do you commit your libraries folder? Do you pull it onto st like dev, sorry, onto staging or production? Like how do you, um, how do you actually do this? Um, when you want to upgrade your library, you have to like download the library zip manually and then extract it into your sites folder. Um, and that's really tedious. Uh, another solution that came out for Drupal 7 is called Composer Manager. Basically that um, it uses Composer and uses Composer.json files in your modules and that allows you to download Composer um, libraries through Composer rather than uh, libraries. So basically it's the same as before where inside of your module file you create a Composer.json file and you basically do require and then um, whatever, whatever libraries you, you, you require, it's about four lines of code usually to include a library so it's pretty simple. Um, and then after you've done that, you can basically enable your module. So it's like Drush and, and then some project, and then Composer Manager will pull in all the projects and dependencies for that project. Um, demo for that as well. So for example, I'm enabling the uh, demo Composer project, sorry, module that I've created. And what that will do is because I've got a Composer.json, it's a lot module, it'll start to download all those um, files that I've defined in that file. Yep, so as, as you can see, it grabs Stripe, Stripe PHP again from uh, the cache. So that took about 10 seconds to grab. And from now on, rather than having to do the, the, the uh, libraries hook, you can just basically define a version number inside of your composer.json, which is great. And so through success. So now you can use composer.json. It makes developers' lives much easier because now you don't have to commit all the um, vendor files. You can basically just tell your developers to do a, a Drush Composer install and it'll grab all the files for that developer and you can also do it on staging and production as well quite easily. Uh, the Drupal 8 solution for this right now is Composer Manager. Uh, each module has got a composer.json, same as before. The major difference between this and this Drupal 7 version is that if you have um, multiple modules inside of, of your Drupal 8 uh, project, um, it basically searches for each of those folders recursively and then downloads them. So if you have dead projects sitting around, like I'm sure everyone does, it'll actually search through those um, composer.json files as well, which is really confusing. So just make sure that you delete any modules that you haven't, um, that you're not using in, in, in your Drupal 8 project. So it's the same as before. So you basically have a composer.json in, in your module. So you have require stripe PHP and then the version number. And then step two is to enable composer manager. So basically you do drush and composer manager and composer manager will now install. Uh, then after that, you can just run a uh, Drush Composer Manager in it. What that does is it generates a, a composer.json uh, in the core directory of Drupal 8, and then which you can then go and overwrite and as, as, you, as you need. So basically, that will go and search for all, the, all, the, all of the composer.json files in, in all your modules and um, create a, a new composer.json for that. Uh, then you need to CD into the core directory and run Dru uh, Composer Drupal update. And what that will do is it will, it's basically the exact same command as composer update, but it will rebuild your uh, composer.json and download the new libraries for you. And then after that, you can start installing your modules and stuff as usual, and it'll do it for you the same as Drupal 7 version. It's a demo for this. So I'm basically doing a Drush Composer Manager, a manager in, in it, which basically in, in, in initializes Composer Manager, and then I'm seeding it into core, and then I'll do a Composer Drupal rebuild, and what that does is it creates the new Composer.json using all my libraries that I've defined in, in my modules file, and then I do a Composer update, which basically goes and um, reins, um, updates all, 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 all the modules. But because I've already done this, it basically didn't know anything, so. Uh, there's a couple of good community resources for about Composer. Uh, there's groups on Drupal.org slash Composer, which is a user group for Composer. It's quite active. There's quite a few threads there. And the Drupal.org slash project slash Composer Manager, which is basically the Composer Manager for 7 and 8, which you can go and download. Uh, so basically, the next thing is how to cr actually create libraries for Composer. Uh, step one is to create your new awesome library, as you normally do. You create a Composer.json file. You submit it to Packagist. Packagist is the uh, PHP... Uh, repository for hosting all of, all of the repos, and then you can start using that new code in, in all of your projects. So 
what Packages is, is basically packages.org. You can go to it, you can find great new repositories, uh, you can like, submit your own, you can do all that sort of stuff. Uh, so for example, to find a library, you can type in like Drupal, for example, and it comes up with Drupal slash Drupal, which is the uh, Drupal 8 um, code, and it has the Drupal extension, Drupal driver, Drupal coder, like all, all, all libraries which you can start using with Drupal. There's also a new in initiative to create a package that's just for Drupal, because there's going to be thousands and thousands of, of modules, and people don't want to overwhelm the package's website. So basically, rather than um, offloading it to a third party, Drupal can handle it all themselves. Uh, since packages is, is open source, they can pretty much just do a clone of, of it themselves and then create uh, packages that way. Yes, correct. Yes, correct. So basically, uh, Drupal packages can be used for the Drupal modules. So um, if you have like rules, for example, for Drupal 8, you can include it in that. So you have Drupal slash rules. And then if rules depends on a module, it, it can pull in from the main packages website, which was it from GitHub. So it's, it's I'm not sure how it's going to work precisely, but that's how it's going to work. So. Well, if you have any questions, just ask. Mid, 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 so. Uh, so basically, you create your composer JSON for your project. It's pretty much the same as before. So you have your name and your description, your keywords, your type, your license, your authors, and then what version of PHP you require. Uh, composer requires PHP 5.3 and above, so you can only use 5.3 and above. Um, and and example, I'm using 5.45. So, yeah. Um, the syntax is like it has to be exact. Like it has to. Um, you can't have invalid uh, JSON because Composer is very, very picky. If you have any typos or commas in the wrong place, it'll basically throw a tantrum. Uh, and to do that, you can basically run Composer validate. And what this does is it uh, validates that your Composer file is correct. Uh, so before you commit all your, all your files, you just run for Composer validate and it'll say um, this Composer is, 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 is basically valid. Uh, so to submit your new library, you basically go to Packages, create an account. Uh, if you have a GitHub account, it has OAuth, so you can just do a single sign-in. Um, you can basically submit any repo URL, so you can do it from Drupal.org. You don't have to use GitHub. So if you have a, a repo on Drupal.org, you can basically submit it. Um, yeah, so you can use Git, SVN, and um, Mercurial. Uh, but what if your code is an open source? So, for example, what if you what, what if your company wants, wants to start using uh, packages, but you can't because everything is all closed source? Well, that's fine. Uh, packages.org is open source, so you can basically clone it and then create your own private packages repository yourself, and you basically create a new line that basically says um, use this server rather than packages for these projects. So it's quite awesome, actually. Yes. So you keep using GitHub or other Yes. And uh, for your private projects, you can use in the composer data, you can use directly the GTS file. Like you give the GitHub repository. Yes. You own this repository. Yes. As a dependency. You don't have to use packages for. Yeah. Yeah, but if you have multiple repos, it's a lot easier to actually just create. You're going to have to, yes, of course. Uh, Yes. So yeah, if if you want to, that's fine. But if you have quite a few, then it gets really annoying to have to like define it in each line. So, but it, yeah, that's if you're large. So, uh, but what if Drupal? Uh, what if GitHub, Drupal.org, Bitbucket goes offline because the way uh, package just works is it pulls in from GitHub on and Drupal and sort of stuff. Uh, there's actually a new thing that came out called Torrent Proxy, which is free for personal use and small fee for, for commercial. What what this does is it. Um, it basically proxies your uh, composer through um, your own local proxy. So basically, when you pull something through, um, it'll download off that. So if you're on a plane or offline, you can basically um, keep a, a local proxy on your, on your computer. Uh, it's created by the creator of, of composer. So pretty much any money towards that goes towards composer development, which is great. Um, so yeah, let's all work together to create better PHP libraries. Um, 
as you probably know, there's like multiple CMSs, multiple frameworks doing different things, and it's all pretty much the same project. Uh, if we can share code, it'll be a lot easier because now um, we can pretty much just like do a composer require of a certain library, pull it in, and then multiple people from different like Drupal or Magento or, or, or like Symfony like can all work together rather than having to like have their own way of doing things. Uh, the nice thing about Drupal 8 is it spun off a lot of new PHP libraries. Um, so, for example, with Commerce 2, there was a, there's quite a few new libraries that you can use for PHP. So even if you don't use Drupal, you can start including those libraries inside of, inside of your own project. Uh, for example, one of them is called uh, it's called addressing. So basically, um, as, as you're probably aware, inside of Drupal before about two months ago, if you had an, an Australian address field, it would it, it wouldn't have postal code. It had something else. I can't remember what it was. Uh, but now, thanks to yeah, it had zip code. So clients would ask me, why does it say this instead of saying the like the, the actual formatting? And there's like 200 different countries. So every single country has got, has got different formatting. So basically what addressing does is it basically solves this. So um, for example, you can have uh, subdivisions for 40 countries. You can have different formatting. So um, it has the proper Australian formatting now, which is great. Um, you can have like, if, you're, if your customer's in like a different country, you, you can set it to them as well. So when you choose your country in your in address field, it'll pull through all that which is great, and it does postal formatting for you as well. So say if you need, like, so say the customer enters an address one way, you can then say, hey, I, I, I want to have this address formatted to be in the format of, of, of New Zealand or Australia or whatever you want to have it as. Um, and this is using the Google Address Data Service, which is basically a open source JSON format that Google has created. Uh, the next one is called Commerce Guys Tax. Uh, basically, this library is a, um, you can use this to generate taxes when you're trying to sell something. So for example, um, say if there's a lot of tax change in a country, for example, say if it changes from 9 to 21%, how do you actually calculate um, what percentage uh, tax you needed to sell it as? For example, say if the item was processed on January, sorry, like in December, and then the tax rate changed in January, you need to figure out um, if it's at 19% or 20%, you can use this library to do that. Um, it has predefined tax rates for countries, calculate taxes in countries you sell in. Um, there's currently an Australian GST pull request that I need to create to actually create GST, so yeah, that's coming soon. Uh, the next one is pricing. Basically, uh, what, what pricing does is it formats the price for any currency and location. So say if you pass a number like uh, 10.5123, it'll format as $10.51 Australian because we don't really use those like anything past two. Um, and you can also tie that in with another library called Swap which basically you can uh, do currency conversions. So say if you have $10 which you want Australian, you want to convert that to USD, you can do that using the library or any other currency like that. Uh, another, another one's called Commerce Guys Zone, which is basically uh, zones of territory groupings you mostly use for shipping and, and tax purposes. So basically you can group up a whole bunch of different um, areas and then call that a zone. For, for example, um, you can do suburbs in Australia, group, like because m m m multiple suburbs have got the same postcode, so you can group all those suburbs up. So say if you want to say, um, I want this zone to have $10 shipping or this zone needs to have $20 shipping, you can do that on a per suburb basis, which is great and it makes uh, calculating and pricing easier for shipping in e-commerce. So you can do like, yeah. Oh, that was quick. Thank you. <laughs> uh, any, any questions? Yep. Um, so do you see in the future a place for Drush Mate? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's hard to answer because like everyone's gonna have their own way of doing things and I'm sure people want to still use Drush Mate, people still want to use Composer install, you know, so I can't. Uh, there is a work in progress for that with eight. So basically, you can define your, pa your, your patch files, and the composer will actually install those for you. But that's still a work in progress. So I'm not sure it'll end up being an Drupal composer or what's going to happen with that. Oh, yep. um, I, I've been playing with the project manager a little bit, and I was wondering if anyone actually has any experience with. I've been using like the auto loading bit for Bob. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering, like, is it doing lazy loading? Like, I haven't looked deep into it yes. enough. Yeah. Yeah, because I just figured it's, if I'm doing that everywhere, is it going to just no. form inside? Yeah. So no, that's why you uh, use... Uh, this part is more part of the ES, uh, ES file, so it's easy to allow the loading. So it's not like ES file 1 or 2 ES. Yeah, see, I'm writing it in that, yeah, that also, standard. Uh, all you don't get is SVP uh, sequential loading. So if you don't kill it, even if you do simple, simple, simple code like it's in an instance of something, you won't actually
Yeah. yeah. Which is what Drupal 8 uses. So basically, when you use the, the uh, use statement Drupal 8, you can basically include the library that way. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm, I'm like, this is in 7, and I'm trying to, you know, you can use that in 7. That same sort of standards, and, and that's, I'm just kind of getting into it, so I was wondering what the pitfall of those things, but. Yeah, because basically you just use use, and then and then the um the uh, name, name, yeah, namespace, yeah. and then you can include it that way, and that's, yeah, a lot better than, sorry. There's a composer component that regenerates the overlay of the file. Yeah, see, that's what, I, I spent hours looking at that, and then yes. it's like, why isn't it working, and. So going through trying to figure out where it's trying to load the library, and that was actually right. the problem was it hadn't been built to. The X auto load. Yeah, yeah. but see, the difference is because that, I think you need to have a way of Drupal, the module name for that to work. Like, I, what I'm doing is actually creating my own namespace directories that don't conform to the auto load format. So that's why this is. You're not conforming? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this well, no, it's a little different well, from, from, from the X auto look that I used to as well. Any other questions? Oh, uh, yep. Yep. No, it, it's uh, this is a contra module that you can use with Drupal 8, but it. Ha Yes. That's a very good question. Uh, what Compose Manager does right now, uh, it basically, when you CD into core, you should, like, in my opinion, you should never touch that Compose.json, which it does currently. They're looking for a solution to fix that. I'm not sure what the final solution is going to be for that, because ideally, I never want to touch core, the uh, core Compose.json, or the um, root director. Jason, so I'm not, I'm not sure how they're going to solve that one. Hopefully they'll come up with something, but I'm not too sure what yeah, they're doing. In beta 6, there was some work done. Uh, one of the guys, he, he created a, uh, basically used a subtree or something to split all the core stuff into its own repository. Mm. And you can create, basically, your own um, basic structure of Drupal, and it uses uh, types, the type uh, field in Composer, in Composer.js uh, on. And so the, you just build your, in the root directory, you just build and say, okay, I want Drupal core. Yep. And then you go composer install, and it just goes and downloads the whole lot for you. Yes. So the whole, your basic, and it uh, goes things, if the types are, is a Drupal module, it puts it into the correct directories. Yep. And um, everything like that, and you just, just run it. It's quite good, because basically your, the basic repository that he built to, to do it is 240K. Yeah. And it's basically just, it ends up being just your work and nothing else. Yes. Um, that's that's another good point, is it like, when you do like Drupal 8 um, deployments, for example, like your repo could be like less than a meg, and then you just do a composer install on production. Will that pull in all, all the Drupal 8 stuff, or how do you, like... Well, when you, when, you do a Drupal, when you do a composer install, it will download the exact, it will use your composer.lock. Yes, that's what I'm saying, yeah. And it will just download everything. And yeah. the version that is in your composer.lock file that you commit yeah. as well. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's going to be really interesting to see how people handle that because are people going to commit everything like, like Drupal Core does? Because what, what Drupal Core does is, is they commit every single library, so all the dependencies are all actually committed. Is that how people are going to handle that for Drupal 8 deployments for their own custom sites? I don't know. So I think you'll be able to do it both ways, but basically if you set, decide you're going to set up and say, okay, I'm going to create my mini repository with that, then you would go, when you get to production, you would mm. just go, Do your checkout, you then do a composer install, and then you do a, um, you load in your new config changes, and yeah, away you go. Updates on DB, yeah, and then you're live. Yeah, that, that's what I'm planning on doing for eight, so yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's basically which way I'm going for eight as well. That's interesting. Cool. Any other so questions? The, the
Oh, okay. I haven't actually fallen into that yet, so I'll have to look into that. But yeah, it's, it's still really heavy in development, so I don't know where it's going to end up for this Composer Manager stuff. Oh, abso absolutely. Like, you have Drupal slash and then... Yes. So basically, when you when you have a, a library defined in JSON, it, it, it needs to be Drupal slash and then whatever the name is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, from memory, it creates it inside of, of the core folder. So basically, where core is, it has a, 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 inside of core. There's a folder called vendor. Basically, that has all the Drupal 8 dependencies, and then it'll put your dependencies in there as well. Is that the same for seven as well? I'm not too sure about seven. Sites or libraries? Is it the sites or vendor? Yeah. Cool. Oh, yep. Um, I use my own class a lot of stuff, but I haven't, I haven't really touched it much on Drupal 7, to be honest, so I'm not too sure. Sorry. <laughs> uh, any questions? Cool. Well, that's it. That, that's it, I guess. It ended a bit early, but cool. Thank you.